Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Delphi Talks here in Science Space, where today we're introducing Warren Spector, uh, who is a profoundly well-known game designer and needs no further introduction. But uh, for those of you joining in, um, he's the designer behind game series such as Deus Ex, uh, System Shock and Ultima. Um, today he's talking about uh, the new game by his studios, Otherworld Entertainment, um, Underworld. And we're joined by Russ Pitts from the Escapist magazine, who is going to be performing the interviews. I'm going to hand things over to them and let them get started, but welcome. Thank you. I had this, I had this entrance all practice. Oh, here we go. <laughs> um. <laughs> So yeah, let me introduce uh, Russ first. So Russ Pitts is the co-founder of both a video game website, Polygon.com, and the mental health advocacy charity, TakeThis.org. He was editor-in-chief of Escape until 2011, uh, before it was purchased by Defy Media. He recently helped reacquire and launch Escapist Magazine Volume 2 for Enthusiast Gaming Media as the company's vice president. Um, Oh, and just a quick uh, housekeeping, too, before we get into the interview. And Warren, um, if you see that cue behind us, there, if you click it as an audience member, you can pose a question for Warren. So that, and we'll answer audience questions at the end. So just to keep that in mind. Um, I think we lost James. Unfortunately, I think we did. Yep. But I think that we've got enough. Do you guys feel like taking it from there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's fine. Uh, well, we lost James, but uh, this is Russ. I'm here. Uh, Warren, I, I'm, I'm hoping you're still here. You're the man of the hour. I'm still here. Fantastic. Uh, well, it's good to talk to you again. Uh, and we've I mean, obviously, I've interviewed you a number of times. You've actually written for us at The Escapist ages ago. So it's part of why I was excited to, to be able to do this event with you. And I'm excited about your new game. Uh, before we get into uh, specific questions, is there anything, uh, anything general you want to talk about? I know you just launched this week. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, Other Side is a couple of years old. Uh, we're just getting out of startup mode, frankly. Uh, and we're really excited. It's our first major release uh, as a studio. So, uh, yeah, everyone's really excited about it. That's fantastic. I'm so excited for you. How's it going so far? Uh, it's going really well. Actually, uh, on the, the first day, we were the number one game on, uh, on Steam, and we had uh, a few thousand streamers, live streamers. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's that's pretty cool. And we're we're happy that uh, the game is is doing justice to the immersive sim genre and uh, maybe pushing that forward a little bit. That's just great. I'm I'm really jazzed, uh, both as a fan of the space and a fan of that uh, series and that world and, and of yours uh, as well. That's just super cool. Um, I wanted to, as my first question for you, Warren, I wanted to take you back to uh, 2006, where you wrote a, a series of articles uh, at The Escapist. Uh, I was there at the time. Uh, I think you wrote them off of a, a, a talk you had given about, uh, called, the, the, art of, the, the, the series was called Gaming in the Margins. And you covered a lot of ground in that series, but one of your central theses was the idea that the future of gaming lied not with uh, AAA blockbusters necessarily, but in the margins, right, and uh, i.e. in an energetic indie space. And in 2006, the idea of an energetic indie space that we know of today was kind of a, a future forward-looking uh, prediction, uh, kind of a radical proposition. Yet uh, in the ensuing years, more or less uh, right after you made that prediction, indie, the indie scene exploded, and now here we are. What do you think were the key moments over the past decade that uh, – transpired or events that transpired that that helped prove out that theory that the future of gaming really would be in the, a vibrant indie space or as you said at the margins well you could kind of see it coming uh everybody back then was talking about um uh 
you know, digital distribution. Um, we were well into the uh, the era of uh, uh, prepackaged game engines. Uh, you know, we used uh, Unreal, a heavily modified version of Unreal for Deus Ex uh, and for Thief Deadly Shadows and Deus Ex Invisible War. Um, and then, you know, Unity comes along and, and all of a sudden, uh, not only do you have engines you can use that anyone can use, uh, you have free engines uh, that are really user friendly. So uh, I think you, you put those two things together, uh, you know, something like Steam had to come along uh, to make it possible. Um, and what, what happened was, or well, the reason it's so exciting is because we got to a point where basically if you had an idea for a game, you had the tools to make it and an opportunity to get it in front of an audience. And, you know, in, in 2006, even that, that wasn't really the case. You could, you could just see it on the horizon. But back then, if you weren't backed by a major publisher, uh, you really didn't have a whole lot of options for uh, releasing your game. Uh, I mean, there was shareware, of course, but uh, the explosion of indie, I think, is really digital distribution and the existence of, uh, of game engines. Mm -hmm. Plus, hey, actually, you know, now that I think about it, there, the other aspect that, that was just beginning to be true back then was uh, games education. You know, there, there uh, according to the ESA, there are over 400 uh, institutions of higher learning that are offering either courses or full degree programs in game development. So not only do you have uh, ways of making and reaching an audience with a game, you have lots and lots of people who want to do it. Uh, so all of that together, I think, is, is the reason why you see it now. That's really cool. Oh, am I coming through? Or am I back? Yeah, yeah, we can hear oh, you. Oh, great. Oh, cool. Okay. Do you have another question, Russ? Before I can jump in? No, go ahead. Oh, cool. And yeah, just to back up a little bit, Warren, maybe you can talk about the relation between Underworld Ascendant and Ultima Underworld, which you produced way back in the early 90s. Yeah. The, what was it? 1992, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the thing that just blows my mind is that people still care. You know, I mean, when. <laughs> When Deus Ex hit its 15th anniversary, I think I did more PR than I did when the game came out. People were more interested in talking about it then. But to go mm. back to 1992, uh, wow. a, a game that, that people still care about uh, passionately is, is pretty incredible. Um, the relationship is, is interesting. It, it's not an Ultima game per se. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's something uh, I guess EA didn't, didn't really want us to do. Um, but there are certain elements of the game. Kabiris is a character from the original game. Uh, the, uh, the lizard men language, uh, is, is out of the first game. Um, the, uh, the runic spell casting, uh, is, is a direct descendant of what we did in the original Ultima Underworld. Uh, and there are, there are little things here and there for fans, but we really wanted to do something that captured the spirit, the essence of those original games, mm -hmm. uh, but wasn't, uh, uh, you know, a straight sequel uh, or something that just recreates what we did. I mean, how many years ago is that? Is that 26 years? Good Lord. Uh, we didn't just want to recreate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's profoundly influential. Like I mentioned this on New World Notes, that uh, Second Life was partly inspired by Ultima Underworld because uh, Philip Rosedale, the founder, uh, played the game for 100 hours and kind of realized <laughs> that you could simulate a whole kind of co contiguous, coherent world. I, and, I did not know that. Yeah. And Science Space is kind of one of the uh, sort of pred uh, successors to that virtual world. So we kind of would not be here were, were it not for uh, Ultima Underworld. Well, I'm not sure I would be here without Ultima Underworld. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I worked on Ultima 6, which was uh, an early kind of immersive simulation in, in a, some simple ways. But Underworld was really the first real-time, fully texture map, first-person game that, that made you believe you were in another world and that offered exactly. you opportunities to, uh, to deal with problems rather than simple puzzles. And that led... To System Shock, which led to you know Thief, which led to Deus Ex, which led to all sorts of things nowadays. So uh, I, I think it, it's kind of amazing how influential Underworld was. And the, the thing is, 
you know, I, I don't want to pat myself on the back too hard, but I, I'll never forget when uh, Paul Nurath, uh, my partner at Other Side, uh, first showed the um, the tech demo that ultimately became uh, Underworld. And I, mm -hmm. I remember there were a bunch of us uh, standing around looking over over each other's shoulders. This was at Origin. And uh, I, I looked over his shoulder and saw this this tech demo and thought, I mean, literally, I thought the world just changed. It it just changed forever, and and sure enough, you know, there there it was a couple of years later, uh, and the the world really did change in a in a small way at least. Oh yeah, well definitely with the simulations. Hey Russ, did you want to jump in with your next question? Yeah, I was actually thinking. Uh... I know you wanted to ask Warren about uh, some of the characters we see, and I think that's a really yeah. good uh, segue uh, to do so. I'm, I'm happy to yield the floor because I'm curious to know about them too. <laughs> yeah, because we imported, because uh, we're both uh, Science Space and um, Ascendant are on Unity, so we're able to bring over some of the characters. So that's what you're seeing around you. And uh, the audience, maybe Warren, you can talk a little bit about the characters and how they fit into to the game. Uh, sure. Well, um... I'm not actually looking at them, so I, there's there's a skeleton and a lizard man, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the the big bad guy in uh, in Underworld Ascendant is a character named Typhon, uh, who was uh, in Greek mythology was uh, a, an enemy of Zeus, uh, and even Zeus couldn't really defeat him. So he's a pretty powerful guy, uh, and his minions are the undead, and so the skeletons are uh, there are a bunch of varieties of them but the skeletons are the uh the enemies you meet uh in the mm -hmm. kind of early parts of the game uh as as minions of typhon uh and the lizard men uh are are actually kind of your allies they're they're not uh enemies uh per se so you interact with them in a uh in a variety of places but in a, a city called markal um where they they kind of mediate i guess uh with mm -hmm. with factions that exist off screen um in in this game you don't actually interact with uh the shamblers and the the expedition and and the others the deep elves um but uh they they exist in the shadows basically uh mm -hmm. and your interactions with them their their representatives are the the lizard men that you encounter in mark hall that's really cool maybe uh before i Give the floor back to uh, Russ. I was thinking um, you were talking about uh, ways of solving problems within the simulations you created. What, what are some examples in the new game of um, uh, player well, creativity there, and such? There, there are uh, places where there are jumps that are too long for you to, to use, and so you have to uh, uh, use magic, uh, to, or you can use magic to get across. But there's always another way. There's, it's not that you have to do that. Uh, you have to get to the other side, but there are lots of different ways to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, some of them are, are multiple path stuff that's kind of pre-planned, but a bunch of them are, are built into the environment itself and how you interact with it. Uh, there are things like um, the, there are slugs that leave a, a trail behind them, and you can discover that the trail is flammable. So uh, if you... You know, if you're out of weapons or something, you can use fire in the environment to set their, their trail on fire and either block enemies or take them out like that. Uh, and so uh, it isn't a game where you just have to swing a sword endlessly and chop wood uh, mm -hmm. or fire arrows at something from a distance. <laughs> there, there are always a variety of ways to get past the problems. And that's that's key for, for me anyway. I... I I tell my teams the word puzzle is not allowed in this studio. You cannot say the word puzzle. <laughs> um, we create challenges, we create, create problems, and then we give the player tools to solve those problems or overcome those challenges. That's that's kind of what uh, immersive sims are all about. It's it's not about pre-planned encounters and showing off how clever and creative you are as a designer. It's about mm -hmm. letting players show how clever and creative they are. 
That's so, fascinating. If you let me keep talking, I'll talk all day. <laughs> oh, somebody say please. Something quit. <laughs> I know this about you, Ward. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, another good friend of mine, uh, game developer, uh, calls that the community. What you just described the the game having more fun than the player, right? Uh, where you create a, a, a situation that's, and I think what he ultimately means is that when the designer is having more fun than the player, yeah, uh, you've you've sort of lost sight of the of the point. Yeah, I've played games which I will not name, by the way, that play themselves <laughs> better than you can play them. <laughs> one of the uh, so one, one of the things you and I have, have talked about a couple of times, and that, that I've heard you. Uh, uh, I can't remember the event where I, I first heard you talk about this, but the idea that in, increasing photorealism in video games would would start to bog down AAA development as it tried to replicate, you know, everything in a realistic way. And I believe the example you used back in the day was uh, a character bumping into a table, uh, and there's a glass of water on the table, and the table has to shake, and the glass of water has to shake, and maybe the water spills, and it just becomes. Uh, kind of a, a set of diminishing returns of, of attempting to create that realistic of a scenario. Is that, uh, I, you know, I is 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 Otherworld and and Ultima are are you attempting to sort of client reclaim some creative space from that uh, series of diminishing returns, or how how big a problem is that for you these days? Uh, well, for other side, it's a huge problem because we're an indie studio. Uh, and can't put hundreds of people on projects. You know, I, uh, on Underworld Ascendant, I, the team was uh, 14, I believe, uh, and we're working on System Shock 3 down here in Austin, and the team is 17. So we're never going to compete with uh, the, the big AAA monster teams, monster games. Um, I'm actually pretty impressed the, at how far we've come since I, I said that. Uh, the the AAA space really is getting uh, to the point where you can build a, a a deeply interactive and immersive game and still have it look that way, uh, look, look uh, photo well almost photo real. We're not mm -hmm. quite there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but for other side, we knew going in that we couldn't compete with that, and so what we wanted to do in, uh, in uh, Ascendant and also uh, in System Shock Three is find a a stylized look for the game that that kind of unasks the question about well why doesn't this look as good as game X? Um, and so if you look at Underworld Ascendant, you'll see a highly stylized environment that is in fact uh, inspired by um, miniatures gaming, uh, mm. you know, like a real D and D game, uh, and, and hmm. it, it looks like a miniature set and painted miniatures by design. Uh, and in fact, uh, many of the uh, characters and items in the game were really modeled out. Uh, there, are, there are three dimensional, solid, real world uh, models of things in the game that are unbelievably cool. I mean, if if we had a brain in our heads, we'd be selling, you know, three D three D printed versions of the things in the game. And you know, who knows? Maybe that'll happen. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's we again we couldn't compete with that so we had to take a different direction uh and it just happens to be a direction that that plays nicely with um the uh the kind of systemic uh, immersive sim sort of sort of ethos <laughs> i can imagine you getting into sort of the the game to life space right with these uh with these uh, miniatures that you can then plug into your game that would be kind of cool uh, yeah, I don't know if, you, yeah. if you're taking feature requests, but uh, we'll have uh, that one for me, if you if you will. Okay, it's it's written down. <laughs> we'll get right on it. <laughs> Excellent, uh, James. Did you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, well, we, we you mentioned Unity, and since Science Space and Underworld are are made in Unity, I wonder if you can talk about the challenges and advantages of creating an immersive world on Unity. And I, and I think I know uh, Will on your team is with you. So in, in case he wants to jump in, he can help out too. That yeah, question. I'll, I'll, I'll start and then turn this over very quickly to Will because I'm, <laughs> I'm the opposite of a tech guy. Um, but uh, Unity has been great. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, we've been working very closely with them uh, and getting lots of input and assistance 
uh, and uh, sneak peeks at what's coming next for Unity. Uh, and there's lots of very cool stuff coming next for Unity, which uh, I will probably get killed if I talk about. But <laughs> uh, no, it's been it's been great uh, having having an engine to start with and build on top of is uh, is critical. Uh, and Unity's been a great partner. So, uh, well, if you want to jump in, feel free. Uh, you, you're the guy who did all the typing. <laughs> I didn't do all of it. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Will. I'm Will Texera, the lead engineer on Underworld Descendants. And yeah, so as for the challenges of Unity, I, I'd say that one of the biggest challenges with Unity is that it has a lot of power and you can easily hang yourself with that power by trying to do way too much with what's there because mm -hmm. you're given so many dials and there's so much you can do and you know there's you want to keep your scope correct and and stay on the right track otherwise you'll go down into rabbit holes of of different areas in in the engine and so but using unity has been amazing for making immersive sim because it's really fast to build up systems from scratch and have systems interact with each other because unity's biggest power is extremely fast implementation and extremely fast reiteration on existing tech. So mm -hmm. every system that we've built, we've been able to iterate on it rapidly over and over and over just to make it, you know, feel better and better. Yeah, actually I'll jump in there as well. Uh, back in the day when we were working at looking glass, uh, we had a system that was built uh, for for Thief called mm -hmm. Act React, which was you know how how different uh, systems interact with different objects in the world in a, this sort of rules based way. And um, I, I would circulate Act React documents to the team down here, and they would just roll their eyes and look at me and say, "Come on, Unity already does that." You know? <laughs> So uh, yeah, pretty powerful tool. That's great. And how, how what was the development cycle like with uh, Underworld? Uh, well, it was it was pretty long. Uh, you know, it started as a Kickstarter project. Right. What was it? Three years ago? I think it was. I think it was three years ago. Um, which I mean, it is a long time. I realize that, and it sounds like a long time. But the reality is, you know, when I I I. I I'm never going to work again after I say this, but uh, <laughs> you know when I when I talk to publishers, I always tell them, you know, if you look at the last six games I've done, they've all taken about three years to make, between 32 and 36 months. Mm -hmm. So if I if I tell you I'm going to make a game in less than than three years, just know that I'm lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> and and I still keep getting work. It, it's amazing to me. <laughs> That's a real. That's actually a really good segue to my uh, next question. And I want before I uh, before I, I spool that out, I wanted to remind the, the folks in the audience: if you have questions for Warren, click that uh, giant queue behind us, pop those in there. Because um, James and I are going to run out of steam at some point, and we want to get your questions <laughs> in uh, before the hour is up. But Warren, uh, speaking of still getting work, uh, like I mean, when I when I think about your career. Not only is it is it incredibly impressive, but you've you know you've created worlds at Origin, you've made blockbuster hits, you know you've you've started franchises with like Deus Ex, for example. You resurrected Oswald the Lucky Rabbit for crying out loud. I mean, some might say you've squeezed games for everything it can offer. What do you continue to get out of making games? What brings you, what brings you back at this point in your career? Uh, well, you know, bringing. Being brought back is actually uh, pretty accurate. I, when uh, Disney shut Junction Point down as kind of the leading edge of getting out of internal development, uh, I was, uh, frankly, I was pretty broken up. I mean, I, I loved working for Disney, and I, I loved Junction Point and all the, the folks who worked there. It was, it was one of the highlights of my, my life, actually, working there. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, but when it was, when it, it came to an end, I, I had to take a break. I, I realized that I needed some different challenges. I've been making games for, well, a long time. Let's just say, you know, 30 years or some craziness like that. And um, so I, I went into teaching. I built a game development program at the University of Texas. Um, 
And, you know, I, I'm really proud of what we did there, but uh, I made a three-year commitment and about a year and a half into it, I said to myself, oh man, molding young minds is great, but I, I, I still need to make some things. Uh, and so uh, at the end of three years, I, I came back and I was, I was going to do a startup, actually. I was going to start another studio of my own. And Paul Nurath, who I, I've known for about 30 years, um, came to me and he was he was the guy behind Looking Glass and, right. you know, designed the first couple of levels in under, the original Underworld and uh, uh, did a game called Space Rogue, which is, you know, little remembered, but was was pretty influential on me. Um, but anyway, he came to me and he said that he was starting a studio and did I want to go in with him on it? Uh, and that uh, he had the rights to do new Underworld games and new System Shock games. And uh, was I interested? And it's like, you know, who, how could I say no to that? <laughs> uh, we've learned so much since the, the early to mid-90s, um, bringing, bringing all that knowledge to, uh, uh, to, to these old franchises uh, was mm -hmm. a great opportunity. So uh, there's still... I mean, I, I still love those worlds. You know, I love the world of System Shock. And, you know, I, I still love the world of Deus Ex, man. If I could go back to that, it'd be great. You know? Someone uh, needs to get the license and, and give it back to you. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Ubisoft has done some interesting things with the, the, the franchise, but I would love to see uh, what you do with it. Yeah, I would platform. too, actually. Uh, okay. So but we have news here. Uh, if Ubisoft wants to hire more inspectors, do another day. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. I've, I've okay, got a, yeah. I've got a full time gig right now. Oh well, there is there is that little thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hey, and if if Disney wants me to come back and do an Oswald game or another Mickey game or a Donald Duck game, I'm up for that too. There you go. That's really good. We should talk a little bit about System Shock Three. I, I know the license was kind of trapped for a long time. I remember uh, Ken Levine was trying to get it and he ended up doing Bioshock just because it was sort of locked. So what happened? How'd you guys get the license and, and what are you planning to do with it in terms of System Shock 3? Yeah, it was it was pretty locked down when uh, uh, there was there was all this weirdness about um, Electronic Arts owning some of the rights and Looking right. Glass owning some of the rights and Looking Glass went out of business and an insurance company ended up taking all of their their properties and you know, so nobody knew what the right situation was. And then uh, a couple of things happened. I, by the way, I'm not going to claim to be a lawyer, so I could be getting a lot of things wrong here. But my understanding is that uh, a company called Night Dive got the rights to the trademark, uh, the System Stock trademark from this crazy insurance company. And <laughs> um, Paul went to Electronic Arts and uh, came away with the copyright. So all of the the actual material in the game belongs to other side and the the trademark belongs to night dive and so we work closely together obviously we're kind of we're kind of bound by that uh but that's that's how we got to make uh, system shock 3. that's really great and, and yeah maybe give us a hint of uh what it's going to be in it what's new and sort of when we can start playing it uh, uh, I would love to start talking about this, trust me, but uh, all I can really say is we're going to ship sometime, <laughs> and uh, there will be some new stuff in it, and uh, that uh, you'll learn the fates of some of the people from the earlier games, and strangely enough, Citadel Station is you know probably going to make a comeback in some way or other, um and showman will will definitely be back uh oh awesome and, uh, terry brocious who did the voice of showdown is right is back doing it again for us so we're real excited about that that was but, my next question if terry can do it That's yeah really cool absolutely and you know if i say any more starbreeze which is our publisher uh will will they'll kill me and then the game will never get made <laughs> and it's coming oh, out in I less than three years right you know, yeah, well uh, there you go <laughs> I am I am seeing audience questions, but yeah, just one more uh, from me. I'd love to um, talk about uh, Science Space. You can access it in VR, and so let's talk a little bit about VR. 
Uh, three years ago, you expressed some concerns around the hype over VR, telling me there's some big problems that are cultural and social, saying, I, I believe most people will be genuinely frightened and disoriented of being effectively blind to the outside world for the sake of entertainment. So I was wondering what your perspective is now and how do you think that relates to the future of game design? Uh, my opinion is exactly the same as it was then. Uh, I, I think the hype has died down pretty dramatically and appropriately. Um, and, you know, is it a fad that's going to go away? Uh, there's a part of me that still thinks that. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, at the very least, I think the fact that it's not being hyped quite so much uh, will allow the people working in the space to to work out the kinks, you know, to figure stuff out, which when that spotlight is on you, it's it's very hard to uh, to experiment. I mean, it's hard to fail, right? I mean, the way to succeed is to fail over and over and over again until you get it right. Um, and people have been failing at, at virtual reality since Jaron Lanier was doing it, um, who I know was yeah. one of one of the folks who came and did one of these before. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, my opinion hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, the, the interesting hypey space now is, you know, augmented reality. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm still a little dubious about that. Uh, you know, no one's, yeah. no one's done anything that, that makes me go, Oh my God, I have to, I have to go play in that sandbox. Uh, but it's, at least it doesn't isolate you completely from the world. So you have to worry about your wife coming up behind you with a baseball bat. <laughs> It's a legitimate that's fear. A, that's a very specific direction to go in that one, Warren. Does that come from a, a personal place, maybe? Are we are we getting a hint? Uh, uh, my <laughs> wife might be listening to this, so let's not go there. <laughs> hi, Car hi, Carolyn. <laughs> that's hilarious. But uh, I actually, I haven't seen much developers creating solutions for that feeling of being isolated. I, I know there's some pass-through technology, but other than that, I really... They, I, I see users like they will create like lock door locks and other ways of making sure no one can sneak up on them. But I don't see developers kind of acknowledging that it is a very isolating thing. Yeah, it's a hard problem to solve. I mean, it may be a problem that doesn't have a solution. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a definite possibility. I don't know. I mean, just personally, I I have very little interest in exploring that space. To be frank. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm still a screen space kind of guy. That share that mirrors my 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 feeling about the space as well. I, I personally I have a huge difficulty with having something attached to my face in general, um, aside from the simple the, the isolation. But I know a lot yeah. of people who are who are solving some interesting problems in VR and who are working with some really cool uh, new ideas and new tech. So I don't know. I, my my sense is just as an observer of the space that there will continue to be a place for it, but I'm not sure it's going to uh, sort of crest the that wave uh, that it needs to yeah. crest to become yeah, more mainstream. I think, I think there's there are amazing uses for it. You know, in in training and maybe even uh, you know psychotherapy. Uh, oh, absolutely. There, there are all sorts of uses for it as a game. Uh, medium, I'm just not sure, and and I actually say that from a, a position of some experience, not a lot, but back at Origin, um, I did two games. Well, okay, that was what two times VR came back ago that VR came back to to change the face of gaming. Uh, two times ago, uh, uh, a game I did called Wings of Glory, and the original System Shock actually supported. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Forte VFX One and the Cybermax, which were the two <laughs> the two big uh, VR headsets back then. This would have been, you know, ninety four. And um, I'll tell you a funny story. The the world was not ready for it. Yeah, they were not ready for the world. But uh, two two fun stories. One was, and I won't tell you which one it was, but one of these things was was so heavy um, and so not ready for prime time. I went down to uh, my QA team one day and w I wanted to talk to my lead tester and he was wearing one of these headsets and it was smoking on his head. It got so hot <laughs> that, that it, it was this close to setting on fire. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. 
Um, <laughs> but the other thing, the other thing was, uh, I, I, Wings of Glory was a World War One flight sim where we modeled the cockpit in 3D. And so you had to look around. You didn't have radar or missiles or anything like that, right? You just had a machine gun that faced forward. And so uh, we supported uh, the headsets. And th this will completely date me now, but the uh, software buyer for software, et cetera, which was that for those of you who are too young, that was a software <laughs> store where people sold boxes and inside there were these discs. What? Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, he came in and, and he was going to buy 15,000 copies of Wings of Glory. And so oh. what, what we did was we, we got this thing called a Thunder Seat, which was basically just a big subwoofer under a leather seat and uh, put a joystick down in front of it uh, and sat him down in the thunder seat, which rumbled. You know, like when you got shot, it would you would feel that you got shot. And, you know, when you're taxiing down a runway, you would feel the ruts in the runway and everything. Um, and so we sat him down there. He's got a joystick between his legs. He's got a <laughs> VR headset on. So he's seeing the cockpit and the, the landing strip and all that. And we tied a scarf around his neck. And then one of my producers set a box fan down in front of him so, <laughs> and turned it on. And he was taxiing down the field to take off. Anyway, he took the headset off after his, this experience and he increased his orders to 75,000. It was awesome. <laughs> wow. So VR, VR did me some good. Well, that's that was, good. Uh, that was back in the lawnmower man days of VR, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. It. Exactly. <laughs> that Amazing. is awesome. And I think, Adam, you had a, a kind of follow-up question around this? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about new and experimental devices, I think it, it's hard to go past the fact that um, when you look at sort of all the, the demographics that mobile is where the, the average user is at, I mean, it's rapidly heading towards the point where a lot of people don't have computers, um, especially of younger audiences. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on the, the difficulties of doing sort of immersive and, and high-quality experiences um, on those mobile platforms, especially with the, the limitations of input? Yeah, you know, I, I can't speak for any personal experience because I've never done it. I've, I've always thought it'd be kind of cool to make a mobile game, but then I started thinking oh, yeah. about the, the kinds of games that I like to make and as powerful uh, and ubiquitous as they are, uh, though it's tempting, I, I don't know how I would actually do it, you know? So uh, if, if someone's stupid enough to give me some money, I'll give it a try. But uh, I, I don't really know how I would make an immersive simulation game for, uh, uh, for you know, an iPhone or something. Uh, but I, I'm a total hypocrite because I almost never turn on my, my PC at home. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's all iPad and iPhone. Uh, and Apple's not paying me, though they probably should now. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of games are you playing lately on your iPhone? Well, I, on my iPhone, I, this is pathetic. Uh, I play a lot of Solitaire. <laughs> uh, and there's, a, oh God, what is the name of it? There's another card game that I've been playing. It's a fantasy card game. The name of which is eluding me, but it's a, it's a ton of fun. Oh, You're trying to... From the Elder Scrolls ones? No, no. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to get obsessive about this, but there, there's a, another card game that's pretty fun. Um... And uh, I'm doing most of my gaming now on my Switch, frankly. You oh, know, Switch when is I, cool, yeah. When I'm not playing Underworld Ascendant and System Shock 3, uh, my Switch is, is, is pretty much the thing. Cool. So we do have some audience questions. Um, jump into them a little bit. Someone named Binary Split, cool name, says, Do you think there's a fundamental limit to the potential scope of immersive sims? Or is there a chance we'll eventually get immersive sims that one could play forever? Uh, forever is a really long time. Um, and uh, even in an immersive sim where it's all rules-based and, and systemic, there's still a lot of content you have to provide. Mm -hmm. uh, so forever is probably too big a word. Uh, for forever, I think uh, you're... Well, even I was going to say, you know, you you kind of have to be in the MMO space where you're you're interacting with other players or, or, you know, the, the more sort of sports oriented games, like, you know, FP multiplayer FPS is, they're really, they're really just sports. They're not games anymore. Uh, and MMOs are, are, you know, this sort of team based stuff. Um, that's where I think you get 
forever from or as close as we're ever going to get given how fast technology changes um but having said that one of the things i love about immersive sims is because it's about problem solving and overcoming challenges you can play them over and over again you know mm -hmm. uh, like uh, i've got a friend who's not a gamer who who played through deus ex uh, seven times and there was mm -hmm. this one time i was i was at a game developers conference and a guy came up to me dressed as J.C. Denton. Oh, wow. And, uh, <laughs> and he, he was from Germany, and or he, he had a very thick German accent, actually, when I met him. And he said, uh, I, I've played through Deus Ex 63 times. Holy and, cow. <laughs> and I said, come on, 60, come on. He said, no, I've played it through 63 times. Uh, and then he said words that were magic to my ears. He said, I'm going back to Germany tomorrow. Because I, I didn't even want to be on the same continent as someone who played through Deus Ex. <laughs> so, I am coming uh, to your house next, Warren. That is part uh, of the game. Hey, I have an unlisted phone number for a reason. You know? <laughs> That's, That's amazing. Uh, actually, someone, uh, Julian 3D, another audience question, me, me, had a related question of comment on how players play a role in ability to contribute as we move to procedurally created games so i guess something like no man's sky or something like that yeah um procedural generation is really interesting um you know I, i'm i'm a, a fan of uh roguelikes you know and and then mm -hmm. you certainly see some people uh doing that uh i've i've always been afraid i mean i'm, I'm a kind of a believer in, in not curated experiences but curated environments, I guess, right? Uh, which is very much what Underworld Ascendant does. They're they're curated environments into which are built those problems that, that you can solve however you want. Um, but uh, certainly, without saying too much, no, I okay. Don't read anything into this because we're not doing this in System Shock Three. But we have <laughs> certainly had discussions about you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could build in some roguelike elements? Uh, it seems it's very unlikely that'll happen in System Shock 3, but at some point in the future, I think I think you'll probably see some of us immersive sim folks trying to build in some of that that uh, kind of thinking into our games. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, got a Unity question from Ro Gastel. On the technical side, what are your recommendations for a good performance in Unity as far as frame rate and such? Over to you, I, Will. Yeah, Will might want yeah. to jump in on this. Uh, good performance in general for frame rate? Um, I'd say uh, the, the biggest thing to worry about is anything that moves from the CPU to the video card. And so set pass calls are where it's at when it comes to that. Um, we kind of became experts at that because uh, at other side we shipped a mobile vr game which is a pretty awesome game you guys should check it out it's called mm. underworld overlord and in that we found out that we needed to keep our set pass calls at under 100 per eyeball on the phone now that was a phone from like two years ago mm -hmm. running vr so that was a lot to, to take in um, so that's probably the one biggest thing to look at and definitely use the unity profiler because that profiler is amazing. That's really cool. Have you guys, someone, another person, Sassy Love, said, have you ever considered opening a help group for Unity? So I guess fellow developers or maybe a, like a Slack channel or something? Hey, we've got games to build. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's enough work. Someone wants tech support. Yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting. Oh, someone asked another. Oh. So yeah, Warren, in, in the 90s, many famous games, including yours at Origin, were uh, releasing multiple games for a year. Now it seems like there's a three-year minimum, like you mentioned. What has changed, and can we go back? Well, what, what's... Also for I binary split. I don't think anything's changed, really. Um, at Origin, we had, at one point, uh, seven... Uh, we called them producer groups, uh, and each one of them was, uh, you know, a profit center. We we got a like I had my own budget. Richard Garriott had his own budget. Chris Roberts had his own budget, and we had um, we had to make money, or you know, we'd get fired. 
but what it meant was, uh, you know, I could release uh, a game in the same year that Chris released a game, in the same year that Richard Garriott released a game. Uh, in fact, uh, I was, I had a, a, a different kind of business model than those guys did. Uh, you know, Richard and Chris were making real AAA blockbuster games, uh, you know, huge budgets, mm. big, big teams for the time. And I, I was kind of the B movie guy. <laughs> I was the guy who said, I don't want to swing for the fences. I want to play small ball and go for singles. So what I would do is I would start up four projects and at the end of the year, I would tell four developers, I had two internal and two external projects. And I would tell those four teams two of you are going to die at the end of this year and two of you are going to ship. And then I would start two more. So I had four going. And at the end of the next year, two of them would die and then the other two would ship. And so I was able to ship uh, usually two games a year uh, because I was willing to work with external and internal teams. Uh, and what it meant was rather than being uh, totally immersed in one game, I could actually you know, be kind of a dilettante and, and look in on each of the games and say, mm. no, 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 that's not what we want. <laughs> you know, make that pixel blue, not green. Um, so uh, it was it was an interesting way to do business. And I, I kind of stopped. There was a point where um, a guy uh, from Electronic Arts, who I will not name uh, because we didn't get along. Um, mm. uh, yeah, anyway. Uh <laughs> I'll tell that story in my autobiography that I'm never going to write. Oh, I can't wait. Um, <laughs> anyway, he said, you know, it's a hit-driven business. I mean, to make a long story short, it's a hit-driven business. And Richard and, and Chris have the right idea. You've got you've got to go for a home run. And so uh, I, I thought he was wrong at the time. But as it turned out, the way, the way gaming developed, he was right. I hate to admit it, but he was right. And so I... I scaled back and started playing that triple A game that, that Chris and Rich were playing uh, and did one game uh, at a time, which has its advantages. I mean, obviously I get to make a lot more of the calls um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm more deeply immersed in the development of a single game, but I do kind of miss that having my fingers in a lot of different pies. That was, it, it was, it was like juggling, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun, very exciting. Uh, and unnerving uh, in a different way than working on one big game is. But now, you know, we're in a world of one big game. So there you go. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another question actually from Dig Vijay on our team. He says uh, he's, he wants your opinion on downloadable content because he hasn't seen any announcement for Underworld downloadable content. Um, what's your, is it coming or, and also what's your opinion in general? Yeah, it's it's coming. I probably shouldn't say any more than that. Um, my opinion of it is it's interesting because, uh, again, I, I'm I'm feeling very old all of a sudden. But um, <laughs> back in in the the late 90s at Origin uh, or the I'm sorry, the, the mid 90s, we were doing uh, expansion packs uh, for, you know, Wing Commander and uh, and the Ultima games. Uh, small adventures that you know would extend the the experience of playing those games, and what we found was they just didn't sell well enough to support the development costs. But mm -hmm. that's completely changed now. Um, and now it's like as as much as I actually said this on Facebook the other day, which again will ensure I never work. Um, but uh, you know, I I'm a guy who wishes games would just end. I I want a, <laughs> an experience and say, yep. That was great. Now I'm moving on to the next game. I mean, that's that's kind of where my heart is at. But mm -hmm. that's not the world we live in now. I mean, everybody's going after, you know, long tail uh, live support. And uh, I, I think it's an interesting thing to do. Uh, I think you have to do it now. Uh, and so I'm going to learn to embrace it. Yeah. Seems like it's inevitable. Yeah. And uh, yeah, one more from Michelle and our team, kind of basic uh, for people starting out in game development. So what, what else does it take besides knowing, quote unquote, how to create the game to get it made? Like how, what's the next step from having the idea? Well, what, the, what advice would you give? The, 
Well, okay, so there, there are a couple of potential questions in there. If you want to know how to go from an idea to a game, uh, the, there's no easy answer. I mean, there are people who can make a game all by themselves, and there are people like me who need a team around them. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's hard to make any blanket statements. But the one thing I would say is um, it takes perseverance. Um, making games is grindingly hard. It, it will crush you uh, if you don't absolutely love it. Um, and so the, the difference between an amateur uh, or a student and a professional is that the professional finishes. You know, yeah. it does, that doesn't mean it's always going to be great, but you finish. Um, and that's, that's the most important thing. I mean, frankly, if you're looking for a job uh, in gaming, showing that you can finish something, not that you can do a student project that looks okay and, you know, it, it's kind of halfway there. No, if you can finish something, that will really help you get a job uh, for sure, if that's what you're looking for. Um, the other Im implied question that I don't think was asked, but I'm going to answer it anyway, is you know, how do you how do you break in? How do you get into gaming in, in the yeah. first place? And whether you're one person alone in a in your bedroom or you're part of a 200 person team, there are two things you have to do: uh, either become the most amazing generalist and become an indie developer, or specialize. You you have to be the best at something because the competition is crazy. Um, and the, the advice I would give, this is, people think I'm nuts when I say this, but uh, yes, this is a highly technical field. Yes, we are making software, but don't neglect the humanities. Um, you know, from a design standpoint, understanding architecture and economics mm -hmm. and, and psych behavioral psychology uh, and history and being able to communicate clearly, those are all critical things um, because you never know what you're going to need to know on any given game. So get as well-rounded an education as you can, even if you're, you're teaching yourself. Get a well-rounded education. And then don't be just a person who says they play games. I, I, I hate it in interviews. The quickest way to not get a job with me is to say, I play games all the time. That's what I do. I love games. <laughs> Everybody loves games. But if all you do is play games and you don't read and you don't play sports and you don't go to movies and you don't listen to music and, you know, whatever else, you don't cook. Um, right. you, all you're going to bring to the table is old ideas. So have a life, you know, have a life. <laughs> That's great advice. That's that's really cool, and uh, I think Russ, you had another thought or comment. I, you know, I just wanted to say thank you to the science based team and Warren for uh, for doing this, and uh, thank you for uh, letting us be a part of it at the Escapist. Uh, I think it's you know we just relaunched uh, this year with uh, our volume two, and uh, we're you know our, our our goal is to to create this type of of channel. Uh, between the readers and uh, game developers. You know, I think in general, one of the trends we're seeing in games is that we're forgetting how to talk to people who make games in a way that's constructive and positive. And I think that, uh, you know, helping correct the course on that is one of our goals. And this evening has been a, a really good example of how, uh, how that can be possible and how that can be useful. So thank you all. And Warren, thank you so much. It's always great to talk to you. Hey, my pleasure. And by the way, The Escapist was great, and I'm sure the new iteration of it is going to be great, too. Thank you so much. We're, we're trying real hard. <laughs> yeah, and Warren, yeah, thank you so much for coming and, and talking. This has been really fascinating. And uh, Adam, maybe you want to um, kind of uh, play the scene off, and I, I think we're giving away some free copies, and you know, thank Warren for coming. and Give a well, round of applause from the audience. I'll be yes, virtually. absolutely. Absolutely, and I, I think I might have horribly um, misnamed your company name at the beginning, so I do apologise for that. Uh, it's a little bit scatterbrained here. It's quite early in the morning. Um, so thank you both for coming. That was a really interesting interview. Um, we do, in fact, have two copies um, of Underworld Ascendant to give away. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to um, place a random number generator in the region, and everyone who wants a copy, just click it. You might just have to wait one second for the uh, team to put that down. Um, but yes, we'd, we'd absolutely love to give us away. And, uh, thank you again for your, your talk. It's been, uh, 
fascinating to hear. And I'm really looking forward to System Shock 3. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, this was great. I, I'd never been in science space or, or done a, a virtual thing like this. It was quite a lot of fun. Very cool. And I, I think we have some, your, your underworld creatures are going to be dancing later and doing some Michael Jackson moves. <laughs> <laughs> That's what You're they do in the game, out, yeah. too. Oh, awesome. Okay. Oh, wow, so, that one's cool. sold. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, we got the, I see the, um, the, the random number generator. It looks like a copy of the box, and Warren is walking off as we see it. But, uh, yeah, everyone give Warren a round of applause. Thank you so much. And, yeah, can't wait to, to play uh, Underworld Descendant. Fantastic. Very cool. Thanks. All right. See you soon. Thank so you. I guess. And how do you? Bye. Oh. Bye, Warren. <laughs> so I think we're doing. Uh, so everyone clicks on the the game. Yep. Click on it, and then I think that there's some trick to it that someone will tell me on how to actually draw the winners. Maybe Ro uh, Rowan.